Good afternoon and welcome to another EEAP presentation. I'm Rick Roman sitting alongside here of the president of EEAP. Michael Crump. And uh, today we're going to be talking about housekeeping. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Now, this topic here, while it might not sound like something that is that you know you probably feel you're pretty familiar with, but we want to go into it a little bit more with some things that hopefully will be help, able to help you uh, identify some issues there in the shop uh, to make sure that you know things are kept safe for your your people there. So what we're going to be going over here is uh, we're going to be talking about general housekeeping and and supervisor responsibilities, uh, proper labeling of containers food and drink in the work area, inspecting tools and equipment, and upkeep of maintenance records. Yep, yep, yep. All right, let's... Okay, so here, good housekeeping is a safety and health issue. It keeps employees safe from slips and falls, as well as colds, flu, and other diseases. Productivity is also affected when time is wasted looking for tools and or materials or avoiding hazards. Poor housekeeping can lead to Kalosha citations. So how, housekeeping is something that's everybody's responsibility. It really is. It really is. And one of the things that's important to remember about this housekeeping issue is a lot of you guys and gals out there at the job sites or in the factories probably think you have good housekeeping as it is. Uh, I had a, an employee that we hired a number of years ago, and her name was Lori McFaith, the great office manager. And it wasn't that we were disorganized before, don't get the, the right or wrong idea. When Lori came into our office, she was able to take us and really do a number of housekeeping items. Not necessarily the clean floors, right Rick, but what, what, how we filed, how we did things. And just like she was able to take our office and manage it in a different way to make it more organized, this is what we're saying that you can do with your shops and your job sites, just to have a little bit more of an organized mindset and be open to the fact to be able to expand a little bit. Exactly, and, and the reality is most of you here uh, on this call are, are clients of ours, and we come out and do inspections for you and help yeah. you to identify these issues, but the reality is is that we're only there you know, maybe once a month or once every three months, depending on, on the level of your service. And, and the rest of the days of, of the month, you guys are the boots on the ground. And, and your supervisors need to be keeping aware of what's going on out there and making sure your people are trained and just get them into good working habits. Yeah, yeah, good working habits. And you'll limit yourself if you think this is about just clean floors and getting the trash off your job site. So don't just think of that. So obviously we'll go over some of the things that your your typical items that, that you're already probably thinking of, so, you know, keeping wow. your, your workstation clean. And, and, and you can look at the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right just from a, a productivity standpoint, being able to find your tools and knowing where things are, um, not to mention being able to, you know, uh, stick your hand to grab something without getting poked by a sharp object or something that might be in that mess. Now I know what you're thinking as you look at these pictures, you're thinking, Rick, why did you pick such a crazy picture? Whose job sites look like this? Now, this is not a picture of one of our clients. I'm going to make that clear. But this is very typical of what we see at some of the shops that we go into. And so you just got to make sure that your work area does not look like this. Now, remember, we've taken two extremes and put them in here. You're probably somewhere in the middle. You probably don't look like the one on the left, right? That is seem to be yeah. overly clean. You're, not, you're probably not working hard enough if your office looks like that, your, your shop. But at the same token, the mindset of having things, everything has a place and organized and clean at the end of the day will make you better productivity and will help the employees keep a mindset to safety. Remember, the spirit of safety does not, in, does not what is the word I'm looking for? It, the, it cannot survive in an unorganized house. That, that, that is true. And, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, I mean, you've just got issues where, I mean, just because of the, the dirtiness of the, oh. you know, illnesses that could come around from it and so now now this is an area where you might have a certain person maybe assigned he's got his workstation and and it's easy to be able to to say that that person is responsible for that area but we've also got common areas yeah. that that your employees are going to be working in that 
might not be any particular person's assignment. If you look over here on the left, we've, we've got some air hoses that are that are sprawled across the ground there. And I mean, for one, this could be a tripping hazard. Good. And and in addition, it's just you know, it, it looks like a tangled mess. So when somebody else goes to use this, they're just going to be spending more time and, and lost productivity in messing with that. Um, in the bottom, you see some some. Uh, electrical cords and the same issue there of the tripping but Michael talk a little bit also about you know the perception if you if you're leaving these cords out and they look like they've been out there talk about the the issue with you having the electrical cords and, and using them one of the things with housekeeping is like Rick is talking about is put your cords away so let me address this in a couple different ways first let me just say on a job site you might have cords all over the place Tripping, Rick is right on the tripping hazards and whatnot. In a factory setting or in a plant or somewhere where you're going to be there for long periods of time, I'm speaking over three days, maybe it's a month or your permanent location, cords can be a problem for you on this kind of a note. And we call it a housekeeping item. Uh, but, but it could also fall under the electrical code system. And this is what it is. An extension cord can only be used for basically a three-day period of time at the max. After that, it, it, if you need wiring, you would need to have it permanently wired. So an extension cord is for a temporary source of power. So one of the housekeeping items that you might be dealing with if you're in a factory or something, you could find yourself being in a spot where you have all these extension cords running through between cabinets, over filing cabinets or whatnot, powering uh, equipment that is there for long periods of time, and that is just going to be a housekeeping item. It's, it's cluttered, it's, it's a fire hazard, Cal OSHA has a, has a code that goes against it, and this is going to be a problem for you. We consider it to be a housekeeping item, but it might be falling uh, using uh, temporary courts for, for permanent location. And, and there again, it, it falls back to where I was saying, we're, we're at your location uh, a minimal amount of time, yep. and, and the chances that Cal OSHA would come in yep. right after we've been there as compared to any of the other days are, are pretty slim, so you want to make sure your supervisors are aware to be looking for these things and training your folks so that you, you don't get caught with these issues. And let me just add, that's different for the job sites when it comes to the extension cords. Job sites are assumed on a, 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 to be used for, for long periods of time because it's a construction site. So if you do have a construction site, you're know, like, well, what am I going to do? Permanently wire the job in? I could be there for months before it's ready for that. Just know that doesn't really apply to construction. Okay, next we talk about uh, about spill cleanup. When, when your folks uh, are, are spilling things, obviously it's a slip hazard, so you want to make sure that you clean it up. Uh, but, you know, a couple of things to prevent those types of things to begin with. If you look in the lower left corner, you, you've got this barrel sitting on the ground, which really should be in a secondary containment like you see there on the right, right. in which case you can avoid the problem to begin with. But when things do happen, you want to make sure that your guys have the proper equipment for cleaning it up and also the, the personal protective equipment that they need to, to mess with the chemicals or whatever they've got. Absolutely, Rick. When you're in these auto mechanic shops or auto body shops or whatnot, you'll find oil like this all over the floor. If you go to the agricultural facilities, you will find that in their maintenance rooms, they have a tendency to look like this. This kind of housekeeping issues needs to be dealt with because, remember, the spirit of safety cannot abide in an, in, a, in an unorganized area. We need to make sure things are clean somewhat. Now, I'm not saying this is a doctor's office, but if you've got oil that can leave tracks like this or whatnot, you've got to figure out a way to stay organized and clean because if the employees don't have respect for clean areas, it's going to be very difficult for them to respect a safe environment. And they, they go hand in hand, which is what we do find, Rick. Exactly. So, the next part here is on the, on the same note is is your guys got to be familiar with the types of of uh, chemicals and whatever else types of things that you're using in the shop to know where to draw the line as as to what they're qualified to handle and what they're not. Certain things you just need to call the professionals in. For. Rick, Rick, you got to call the professionals. But why do we have a picture of NASA walking in there, Rick? What, what what is going on with this picture? Well, I'm not sure that they're from NASA, but they sure look like it in those uh, hazmat suits that they're wearing. But sometimes certain chemicals that that's just what it's going to take and and. And you want to make sure your guys need to know what limits of the things that they can deal with and what they can't deal with. Let's hope it's not uh, August in Palm Springs that they're doing that with, Rick. That could be a, a soupy mess in that, in that outfit. Oh, absolutely. I do agree with that kind of statement, though, Rick. You've got to have the right personal protective equipment and, and, and guards and, and put in place so that when you do have a mess or a mess, you can clean that up. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, and, and sometimes you, know, you might be working with things that you may not even think that are necessarily 
bad, but in certain quantities they are. Years ago, uh, when I worked in the trucking industry, we would ship the caffeine that they would put into soda. And when you had the caffeine by itself, it was in such a concentrated form that we did have a spill on the dock one time and we had to clear and evacuate the place and bring in professionals to contain that. All right, all right. Okay, now some of the other things. Holy mackerel, that is a crappy looking sink wreck. Well, and shockingly, we've probably been into some places that we've seen sinks that probably look pretty close to that. Listen, if you are in a facility right now, you're looking at this picture and you think to yourself, well, that's the picture of my sink, uh, you got to send me some photos of that. That is pretty good stuff. I mean, that is horrible. Who would ever wash their hands? Like, uh, well, at least they're wearing, using soap, right, Rick? <laughs> yeah, it appears that they are, but, but the, the issue here, not only is it unsanitary, but there's actually an OSHA code that when it comes to to your bathrooms that said that the facilities have to be kept clean, maintained in good working order. And something as simple as that could actually, if Calosha might be in your at your facility, now granted they're not going to probably come for something like this, but this is just something else that they can tack on to whatever else their purpose is already that they're there for. And I agree with Rick. The only saving grace here is they're using the Irish Spring. I have seen their commercials, and Irish Spring is a very powerful soap. It's one of my favorites, but i got to tell you, this is not as uncommon as you think. If your bathrooms look like this, your toilets, your sinks, you have got to do something as an owner of the business's management. you got to do something better. And the first thing when I tell people this, what they say to me is, I clean it, but the employees trash it themselves. I understand that. You've got to have a cleaning schedule in place, if that's daily, weekly, whatever, to make sure that the bathrooms are sanitary in, in some fashion. Even if you have to ask the employees to build a schedule and they have to rotate themselves through as they clean it. That's fair, too. <laughs> And yeah, that's right. where I was saying where, you know, areas like this is not anybody necessarily no. in particular's well, okay. uh, responsibility. It's nobody's workstation. So you, so the supervisors just have to make sure that somebody's assigned or that somehow that this is getting done. Here at EAP, I hire a cleaning crew. They come in and they do the sinks, toilets, and that kind of stuff. I know that's not uh, acceptable for everybody and that's not always feasible. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with putting together a calendar and saying, all right, at the end of the day, somebody is going to go and spend five minutes to straighten up the bathroom and putting that together. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, especially if you've got people that are doing this to it. Yes. Not at all. Rick, tell me about the eyewash station. So the eyewash station down below, again, is something where when we're coming in, we're checking because this thing needs to be flow tested every month. Yep. Um, we're, we're coming in, and if we're coming quarterly, somebody there needs to be checking it. Uh, the other two months that we're not there. Making sure this thing can flow water, you're going to need caps on this, and these are just basic uh, the housekeeping rules. So when we talk about housekeeping, it's these small little things like putting the caps on your eye wash, making sure the sinks are clean, and making sure it doesn't have all this dirt and whatnot. We have some trash facilities that do trash recycling, paper recycling, and the dust and the debris falls into the, the basin of the eye wash station. They have tents that can go over these to keep them clean and the dust off them. You might think about that kind of thing. Exactly. So, so that's something there that you, you definitely want to consider in just keeping that thing clean. Now, this is some really common issues that we run into. Um, when it comes to blocking things like your power panels, exits, and aisleways. And they are good out there with that, Rick. They know how to block an exit. You, you'd think that nobody would ever need to use it. A blocking exit is something that people do without even thinking. Uh, I bet as you're watching this webinar right now, you're thinking of three or four exits at your facility that are blocked. Uh, if you're not at a, at a facility, what I find is you still have job sites where the exit is blocked on a job site. The driveways are blocked at times. People can't get in and out and whatnot. So you need to think about this no matter where you're at. Exactly. And, and, and there are codes. These are citable issues. And, you know, one of the things that we said, these pictures appear that, like, maybe people have stacked stuff up and, and they're just sitting there and may have been there for a while. But a lot of times you have employees that might be unstacking a, a pallet of boxes that just came in, like you see there in the aisleway. Now, in the aisleway, obviously, there's nothing you can do. And, and if the attendant is right there and he's putting the stuff up on the shelf, 
a different issue, but you'll see people will will put stuff and block the doorways as they take the stuff and depalletize it, and then for whatever reason they're called on another task, yep. and now you've got your blocked exit in an emergency. It's just a bad deal. Bottom right hand picture, you'll see an aisle way that is blocked in our mind. Now there is a space there, but you know, you, obviously people are suggesting you can get down and in. If you're finding that you're having to use it because you have overflow, you've got to figure out another solution to that. That is going to be a problematic for you. Boxes can shift, move, and create a lot of blockage problems. OSHA will find, see that and they will find us for that. So you really got to do something about that. Bottles, Rick. Bottles, right. bottles, bottles. And proper labeling of containers. And here's another issue that we see out there often. The Gatorade bottle seems to be a very it is popular a, it is a bottle. Popular bottle. What, what is your flavor of Gatorade, Rick? I like the orange flavor. <laughs> Mine is the grape. <laughs> the great flavor is refreshing, Rick. Well, I, I prefer I prefer the orange, and uh, but what the people like to do often is is when they're done with it, they'll tear the label off it and they'll use it at work as a water bottle, or sometimes they'll even use it to put something in there like acetone or what have you. One you'll find interesting is me and Rick both like Gatorade. He likes the orange and I like the gray. What's interesting about that is both of these look like cleaning chemicals. And so when you put another chemical in a Gatorade bottle, sometimes it's hard to relabel. Now notice the pictures on the bottom left side. You can see one that is clear and one that says water. The problem I have is that magic marker that's been written on there will rub off at times and that plastic bottle itself a lot of times has the words Gatorade that are embedded into the plastic and they're in the mold, and so that makes it very difficult to relabel a bottle like that. You should consider having bottles that look like the top uh, left picture to the right side, the one with the red cap and the other one with the acetone. Those are clearly not drinking containers, and they won't be mixed up or have a tendency to get mixed up. And buying those through uh, Granger, Uline, whatever, you can buy those for pennies on the dollar, make a case of them so that if somebody needs an oil container, they can do that. This is a classic housekeeping issue that can create organization to go to pot and hand baskets. So the bottom line is, is that if you've got guys out there, if they're drinking water bottles or what have you, if it's in the original, like you see the one that came that has the label on there in the upper left, that's fantastic. Yeah. If if they if the label's been ripped off, they need to mark what's in what the contents are that are in there. Um, when it comes to chemicals, prior to last year, it would have been adequate to you see the bottle there that says acetone. That bottle will no longer fly. You can no longer on on hazardous chemicals just write what it is. You actually have to label it. So you see the little acetone label that we have up there in the upper right corner. Yep. So if you're buying acetone in 55 gallon drums and then transporting it into smaller containers so that your guys can use it, you need these smaller labels. The guys that you buy the chemicals from, they have to label the barrel that you're buying it from, but they don't have to provide you with additional labels. And for those of you who may not be aware, we have an online sticker store. <laughs> and yes, we have solved the problem for you by creating an online sticker store. This sticker store will have the solution for these labels. Now, as Rick is talking there right now, remember, we have not seen a lot of enforcement regarding the acetone label in this new feature. But by the year 2016, as we get into that, they are going to be starting nailing people for this and getting into the, in the depths of it. All of my OSHA contacts are telling me that sometime next year they will be doing this. And so it's not like you're going to be able to do this overnight. And so I do recommend getting these smooth, flat surface bottles that labels will stick to. And the Gatorade bottles, you can see with all the little depths grooves and noobs, you, it's very difficult to stick something like that to it. Uh, the Windex bottle is a good, good, good example. You know you're going to need a spray cleaner. You can get these. They sell them cheap and you put the label on. Exactly. I think my label started at about $1.50 a piece. Uh, and we're, we're trying to get them cheaper all the time and uh, we can print them up for you and put anything you want on them. So, so if know. you do need them, we can help you with that. But the, the, the main thing is, is just to know that they need to yeah. be labeled Thank however you. you're getting it handled. Yeah, somehow. Wow, Rick. So, wow. Yes. So first, let, let's talk about the microwave up here. We've got a microwave that is obviously out in a shop area, and, and this is another common thing that we see out there. And, and Michael, what is, what is Cal OSHA's take on, on this, or, or, or what, what is our general well, recommendation when it comes to this? The thing with the microwave, first of all, it's disgusting looking. I, mean, I know any lady that is watching this is thinking, nobody would ever use that. I'm telling you, we do see this kind of circumstance all the time. 
Now, the, the first problem with a microwave in a work environment is that there's not a Kalosha code that says you can't have a microwave in a work environment like this. There's no Kalosha code. I want to make that clear. But what it does say is that you cannot prepare your food in environments that could be contaminated. That does say that. Now, microwave is not a, a something that you mold the product with, usually. I do understand that microwaves are used to heat up things, certain things and products, and I've seen a number of clients do that. But for the sake of argument, let's suggest that that microwave in the top upper left is a microwave that is used preparing food. Because it is preparing the food, the microwave cannot be used in this area. How do I know the area is bad? Well, I can see on the door where they touch it all the time to shut the door to heat up whatever they're heating. It's dirty in there. There is a bunch of crap all over the microwave. In fact, I can tell you the buttons they like to push because of the amount of dirt and slime. And that is what your employees are ingesting, and that's the problem with this. So this is a housekeeping issue. This is one of those details that is always overlooked. You haven't provided a break area for your employees. You haven't provided them to go there. And there's no law saying you have to have one. But because you haven't tried to do that or you might just be limited on space, you've allowed these microwaves to come in. This can be problematic for you when it comes to sickness and, and health and allergic reactions to a lot of the chemicals you have. You'll you see the top right picture uh, about a guy with some seriously hairy arms that he is shaving off a lot of the stuff off the side. Um, it's like fiberglass or something. It does you, look you've like got, it. You've got a lot of stuff flying around, and you know there's stuff floating around in the air. It's all over him like that. Now, I'm betting that Rick Roman cut and pasted that cup of coffee in the background. Can you see that cup of coffee back there? I think Rick Roman cut and pasted that thing. I, I did, but uh, it was hard to find a picture that was going to be able to drive the point home, but, but you do see stuff like that out there. And you that's, do. And that's what I wanted to, to illustrate here with it. So two things, Rick does pick these pictures once in a while. I have demanded from him that he pick a better picture of a cheeseburger. Let me make that clear. That thing is sad looking. We've got to get something better looking for that. But the cup of coffee is classic. You cannot have an open container in a work environment that you're drinking out of. This is going to be bad, bad, bad. So we have three choices of containers. You've got the water bottle, and you've got the open a glass of classic Coca-Cola, which just looks beautiful, and you want to drink it. you, you got to have, you probably should have the screw-on container. The one in the middle is a coffee cup with a top on top. But the problem I have is there's still a hole there that my lips are going to go to that are going to get contaminated. So yes, the water bottle is the right choice, and the cup of coffee is better than the glass, but hopefully we're evolving up to the screw-on containers or something where the lids are on tight where stuff can't get into because of the, uh, the potential for debris to get in there. And so the cheeseburger really, Rick, is for what purpose besides the irritation? Just, well, just basically to illustrate the, the fact that when it comes to having food and drink out in the work area, in the production area, where there's airborne particulates, you just cannot be doing it. So not only you, you, you shouldn't you be preparing your food out there, you shouldn't be eating your food. And, and sometimes we have places that don't have a break room. And that's right? understandable. Sometimes there are circumstances. And, and so you just need to make sure that you, your guys aren't out there eating and drinking food in open containers uh, in the areas where they're out there working and, and there's stuff lying around in the air. Rick, can we get better cheeseburgers than that? We don't have to eat that on our lunch break. Right? Well, I, hopefully not. That thing is terrible. Looking. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about inspecting the tools and equipment. So you want to make sure that not only, you know, that the supervisors are, are familiar with it, but that the employees that they know some you know you, you get to work in a, on a job site and you've got the you've got skill saws and air hammers and whatever else that you got going on out there and and you can see up in the up in the the right corner there where the cord is just coming out of the sheathing there and it's you've got a little bit of exposed wire there Michael. These four, these three circumstances from the electrical cords and variations in the rebar are some of the most common things that we find when it comes to what I call housekeeping. These things are things that you'll have to do every day. If you're not doing a daily walk of your job site or factory to make sure it's all good to go before we get, to get it started up, you're, you're missing the boat on this. You're looking for cords. You're looking for guarding to make sure their guards are on good. Everything is rock and roll before your shift starts. If you're on the job site and you're the safety guy, every day you should be walking that job site to make sure all the rebar is put on, the cords that you can see are looking good. And I'm not saying that's just once throughout the day. That might be something you do a number of times. But at least in the beginning, you're starting out the day right. Because when you do that, it, it, you're safety conscious right out the get-go. You can instruct people on what to fix, what to look out for, and it gets you going. 
a lot of times as AP professionals, we, we forget about the daily housekeeping options because we're too busy filing reports and doing a lot of things like that. Try to keep it simple. Simple, simple, simple. Start with five or six items, see if you can implement those on a daily basis, and then you can move on if you feel like you need to complicate things more. But these things in the picture, classic. Classic things that your guys, am I right, Rick, will use even though they're not, they'll work around the rebar even though they're a cap, and they'll use those plugs even though they look like hell. Exactly, and, and the thing with the rebar, you can see obviously it wasn't a, a failure to do it. Some, no. Somebody clearly did, but there's one missing. My guess is that somehow that thing got knocked off. My gosh, I've read that until my head comes right off my shoulders. And that's why the housekeeping and the walk-around part becomes so important because just doing it the first time isn't adequate. you got to make sure that they're on there. So so you got to be going back and, and check, you know, if your employees are aware of it, you walk, people may have walked by that yep. spot three or four times and saw the cap laying on the ground and no one picked it up and put it on there. So yep. you, so you got to get your guys in, in, into knowing to do that. And the thing with these electrical cords, um, the one with the sheathing there on the tool, that might be able to be pushed back up in there and unscrewed, taken apart, and, and, and fixed. But those plugs, you cannot splice these electrical cords. you you, you got to replace them. you got to. All right, another housekeeping option that we're going to talk about is when it comes to uh, these kind of machinery, heavy driving equipment, machinery, forklifts, backhoes, these, you got to do maintenance records on these things. you got to make sure the housekeeping, the belts work, everything is looking good before you use them every day. This is a housekeeping item that you just need to make sure the basics of keeping everything running is, is in good good standing. So I don't know how much you will want to spend on that one, Rick. Uh, no. Just, but we just need to make sure you understand you got to watch your, your equipment, tires, seat belts, and all that jazz. Exactly. So th that, that's pretty much of what, what's going on, on on that there. Yes. Um, you know, it's an important you guys got those logs, and, and you just got to make sure that your guys are filling them out so that the maintenance is getting done and, yeah. and that you have all that. Um, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and, and uh, send your questions in if there's anything that we can help you. In the meantime, real quick, like, uh, let's go back here. And uh, for those of you that are not EEAP clients. If, if you're not an EEAP client, we'd love to be able to come out and see you a little bit and tell you a little bit of what we do. We do a free workplace assessment to come out there and take a look at your documentation and whatnot. Uh, let you know who we are in person, uh, and if you do want autographs from me and Rick, we can provide those uh, now that we're famous on the webinar. Obviously, I'm kidding. But the logic here is if you're interested in that, let us know. Uh, the questions here, some of the questions are coming through. We're going to answer them, and some of them we might just answer directly because they, they might not really pertain to things. We're trying to speed that up, but as of the presentation, if you do have to go, it is over, but we're going to answer some questions, so those who would like to stay on, they're more than welcome to. I know all right. we've got busy days. Rick, you got a question there that yes. somebody wants to hear? Someone's asking here about rebar cap. Ah. Uh, required at what angle slash degree coming from question mark? Gotcha. All right, rebar. So they're in the Calosha code, you're not going to find, and I would beg in, in the Fed OSHA code too, in the OSHA code, you're not going to find that rebar sticking at this angle needs to be capped. Any sort of degree. What it's saying is if it has the potential to pierce or probe or injure somebody, that really is when it has to be capped. So you can have rebar sticking straight up, you can have rebar sticking at this angle, you can have rebar sticking like this and it's got to be capped. You can have rebar sticking straight down and it still needs to be capped. Why? Because there's people that are underneath it that could hit it if it's sticking that far down. So there really isn't it about an angle, you just need to know that when it comes to rebar, you want to cap at any, at, any, at, at any angle if it has the potential to impact or, or penetrate somebody. So if you have a piece of ground like this and the rebar is coming out like this and it's poked down like this, you might say I'm not going to cap it because really nobody's getting between the ground and the rebar, so you might not cap that. But if it has the potential to penetrate somebody, you, you, you want to cap it. All right. Well, seems like we got all the questions. Got a pretty straightforward webinar here. And, and, and I, I take that, Rick, is that we answered all the questions in the webinar. We did answer all the questions in the webinar, and, and most of you are probably familiar with a lot of these things already, uh, but hopefully we're able to clear up some of them for you. Um, if any other questions wind up coming in after we sign off, we'll have it up for a few minutes here. I'll, I can answer them to you directly. If you, if you do have any issues uh, that you want us to take a look at, let us know. But when we talked about this webinar, we had a lot of people asking us about, we're not under, excuse me, understanding what, what housekeeping is. 
And the problem is a lot of times as safety professionals, if you're watching a job site or you're a manager, the safety housekeeping issues, you're thinking, well, the floors are clean. It's more than that. You really got to pay attention to doing the daily checks. The, the daily housekeeping, making sure everything is the basics of everything really is rocking. And if you have that mindset, you'll be good to go. Anyways, anything else, Rick? That that's gonna wrap it up for today. Um, Simple. We'll we'll be checking back in with you next month and send out an invite for our next webinar. So until then, uh, stay safe out there and uh, thank you guys for coming and attending with us today. Good luck out there.